Hi, welcome to the Craft of Living. I'm Andre Rancic. I would like to welcome you to this episode today. And as always, we are going to start with a couple of updates. First of all, I want to share something that I read this week, um, but I have to go back a couple of years ago. I had the chance I stumbled upon. I stumbled upon a graduation speech given by William McRaven, an admiral in the US Navy. And he gave a speech at UT Austin where he talked about, I think the title of his speech was Make Your Bed. At least if the name of the book that he developed then based on that speech kind of expanded some of the themes. Now, I don't want to go into some of the sort of military issues that he's discussing, uh, certainly not the ethics of warfare, of American foreign policy and, and all of that, but simply in terms of life advice, I found this to be very inspiring. He doesn't share many new things. Uh, a lot of the things that he is kind of unpacking, you have heard before, like the importance of teamwork and never to give up. You know, don't underestimate people. Don't look at the outward appearance. Look at the heart. Again, never, never let def be defeated by circumstances. Never give up and all of that. So it was a wonderful um, read actually, I did not read to it. I listened to the book, so um, I would I would recommend it to you if you if you don't want to read the whole book, go ahead and listen to his graduation speech. It is it is quite fun and it has many important life lessons, certainly for college students. But I would also say that a lot of the things that he shares is something that any person can appropriate to some extent in his or her life. So that was the one thing that I uh, wanted to share that happened the last week. Another thing I just, another thing that happened is I got this book by Catherine Wilson, How to Be an Epicurean. I think I referenced it last time um, during my episode, although it is quite possible that I ended up actually excising that particular part. I'm not quite sure right now. But in any case, here is the book by Catherine Wilson, How to Be an Epicurean, The Ancient Art of Living Well. And for me, this book is very interesting. It just, first of all, speaks to this resurgence of practical philosophy happening in contemporary culture. And it is for me also interesting because it provides a juxtaposition to, or I would say an alternative approach to life than what we have in Stoicism. They're quite complementary, Epicureanism and Stoicism, but they also diverge on many issues. And I have not read the book. I'm looking forward to, to do so, however. And as I look at the table of contents, there are many interesting chapters. You know, um, for instance, morality and other people thinking about death, what is real, what can we know? So questions about, you know, metaphysics, ophthalmology, questions about epistemology and ethics, very interesting. But I, I think it's an accessible read. So uh, people who are interested in these kind of issues should be able to read the book. And then obviously the meaningful life. And then the concluding chapter is, should I be a stoic instead? And in that chapter, she has a table, if I can put it that way, where she, I can even show it to you, I don't know if this is visible or not, where she compares the main concepts in the Stoics and the Epicureans, and then, well, you know, invites you as a reader to ask yourself, where do I fit or do I fit at all in any of these categories? Uh, for the Stoics, she says that for the Stoics, emotions are generally bad. And that is a highly debatable fact. I'm, I'm not sure that is true. Many Stoics would push back against that. But in any case, so for the Stoics, emotions are generally bad. For the Epicureans, they're generally good. Uh, family life for the Stoics is important. For the Epicureans, it, it is inessential. For the Stoic, suffering is inevitable. And for the Epicureans, on the other hand, it is minimizable. Pleasure generally bad versus generally good. Um, orientation, universalist versus relativist. The purpose of ethics, virtue on the Stoic side 
versus freedom from harm on the other side. So I think that this is quite an interesting thing and I hope actually to use this in my classes when I talk about the difference between the Stoics and the Epicureans. So this is, this is one thing that I'm very excited that I, although I, I recommended it last time, but I at that point still did not have it. So I am very excited that I have that book. When it comes to my personal life, things are going generally well. You know, I have certain goals for this year as a good number of you have. There's this one thing in my life, and I can mention one of the goals perhaps, uh, and that is that I have fear of, of cold water, which is a little bit paradoxical because, as you might know, I played water polo quite a bit when I was young, in my, in my teenage years, and we often practiced in very cold water, but I was never comfortable in it. I resented it. I hated it. And so cold water is kind of a source of fear for me. On the other hand, I am not afraid of cold. Actually going outside on the snow in my shorts and short sleeves after a sauna experience or hot shower or hot bath, or even just generally just sitting outside in the cold, that is not a source of dread. I actually enjoy it very much. <laughs> I have to share this. Actually, my daughter, she, you know, she had a dream the other day uh, about me walking around undressed and she is driving by in a car with her friends and the friends are saying, hey, isn't, isn't this your dad? And she said, no, no, I don't know the guy who he is. Just, just drive on. So there's a sense of embarrassment because she sees me walking in the neighborhood in the morning sometimes in this cold weather, Michigan weather, in shorts and short sleeves. So cold is not a source for me uh, of, of dread for me. I enjoy it. It really feels very good. I believe that this positive stress that we give to our bodies, bodies uh, through you know, hot and cold exposure and then fasting is incredibly beneficial for our immune system. And some people even say it helps against dementia. I don't know if that is true or not, but really, I feel really good. But cold water is a problem. So that is now a challenge for me for this year, that I want to become more resilient in that regard and uh, be more willing to take cold swims or swims in cold water which of course we have quite a bit here in Lake Michigan. And, and this is interesting, right? This paradoxical thing. I am attracted, I am dread cold water. And then at the same time, I am just fascinated when I see the videos of people, you know, not just jumping into ice water, but actually swimming and diving. There's something remarkable, remarkable in that. It is, you know, for me, an uh, image of, of the sublime. When, when people are, you know, you know, cut a hole and jump into the lake or the water and then swim under the ice. It's just amazing for me to look at that. Now, what one could argue, you know, that the fact that something is amazing doesn't mean that you should be doing. You know, I think that um, Alex Honnold's, uh, you know, free solo achievement is amazing, yet I think it's absolutely crazy and ridiculous to try to do that. And one could say also about cold swimming, but but I have decided to to take a step in that. That's going to be an area of growth in my life, and it comes to kind of my physical well-being. Of course, I will not jump now into cold water right now in Lake Michigan, but I will I will start perhaps you know with some wetsuit um, you know in the spring and then summer for sure, and then we'll see what will happen next fall and winter if I can grow into that. So this is about my life, just a couple of updates, and now we can turn to our episode. In my last episode, as you might recall, I shared some insights about Stoicism. Actually, I shared some of the things that I appreciate about Stoicism from a, from a healthy distance, with a critical lens, but nevertheless, things that I find to be congenial to my own philosophy of life and approach to life and the way I understand the craft of living. I also noted how there has been a resurgence of Stoicism in our contemporary culture. And for me, 
nothing illustrates this point better than a conversation I recently had with one of my former students who is a minister and who told me that in the past years he has been devouring books on Stoicism, including books by Donald Robertson. I believe he mentioned How to Think Like an Emperor. I think that's the book that he mentioned. He told me that he read the Meditations by Marcus Aurelius twice. And for me, that was so fascinating because a statement like that would have been unimaginable 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, it, it is imaginable, but it would be very unlikely that a Christian pastor, a Christian minister would be exposed perhaps to Stoicism to the degree that he has been. I mean, people have read Stoic books all the time. I mean, for a long time, I get that. But nevertheless, for me, that was a good illustration of how Stoicism is kind of percolating our contemporary collective uh, consciousness. And there are many reasons for that. And perhaps one, one reason is uh, Charles Taylor in his book, The Secular Age, A Secular Age. Is it The Secular Age or A Secular Age? I forget which um, article it is. But he writes about that as a result of kind of moving into a post-Christian society, the rise of secularism, what we have is this kind of Noah effect, where we suddenly have the multiplicity of options, of life options that people have and are able to pursue. So how to be an Epicurean, right? Or how to be a Stoic. And you have many, many other ways of life that are jostling in this marketplace of, you know, uh, life options, to use that word for the lack of a better term. So there's a reason why that has been so popular. You know? Like, what can we find? What kind of, what way of life can we find, people are asking, after the demise or a significant demise of Christianity in, in this country, in the US, and certainly in Europe for uh, much longer now. So this is an interesting question. That's one of the reasons, I believe, why we have Stoicism and the growth of Stoicism and the popularity of books on that particular ancient philosophy. My own interest in Stoicism, and I did not mention that, uh, they predate this current boom. I, I don't remember when I first encountered Stoicism as a philosophy. I don't know, but I do remember when I first started thinking seriously about it, and that was about 25 years ago, uh, as a result of reading a book by Pierre Adore, Philosophy as a Way of Life. Actually, one of my earliest episodes, I describe how Adore's book has been instrumental for me in actually starting to think, start to think along the lines of this channel, right? If I had to, or this podcast, if I had to credit one book in addition to the books that have formed me in, in terms of my religious beliefs, it would be certainly Pirado's philosophy as a way of life as providing this spark to think about Stoicism, Epicureanism, and generally philosophy as a practical endeavor as a type of therapeutics. So that's how it began. And it was Pierre philosophy as a way of life, and also reading Paul Tillich's Courage to Be, in which he merges uh, Christian insights and some Stoic insights. Even though, despite the fact that he names Stoicism as the one true alternative to Christianity. He, on the one, on the one hand, he kind of puts them into completely opposite camps in terms of their basic metaphysics, understanding of you know, providence in Christianity versus fate, F-A-T-E, in Stoicism. These are incompatible perspectives. And yet again, he, when it comes to affirming the meaningfulness of human life in the face of suffering, he finds many interesting things in Stoicism. So for me, that was kind of uh, very important. And as I already kind of intimated in, in referencing Tillich. I don't consider myself a Christian Stoic. It all depends what you mean by Christian as an adjective in that connection. But I feel uncomfortable in 
with that term, despite my appreciation of many of the things that Stoicism stands for. And there are two, two reasons I can mention. First of all, one that I've already kind of hinted at, and that is the conception of fatalism that is essential to Stoicism, the, a spirit of resignation to the predetermined structure of the universe. Uh, it kind of comes close, perhaps, if you are a hyper-Calvinist and you believe that God has predetermined every single thing in your life. Uh, Calvin even, even writes about how every single hair, when it falls off your head, has been, that that act, ha that that event has been willed directly by God. So if you have that kind of predestinarian, almost fatalistic view, Christian view, then you might be even uh, closer to Stoicism than I am. I don't have that view of God and that, that view of divine providence. So I see this strong sort of difference in that regard. And then also the Christian, or the, rather the Stoic conception of God, which is, for the lack of a better word, this kind of a pantheistic deity, impersonal force, logos, in which we participate, the kind of the spark of the logos is us, which gives us this um, quest and desire for rationality and to be united with the cosmos and all of that. Again, um, I have issues with that. But nevertheless, um, as in many other areas of life, right, when it comes, let's say, to nutrition, like many people who are unbelievers who are atheists, right? Uh, agnostics, uh, followers of different religious persuasions are able to say excellent things about science and about nutrition specifically, right? You, you do not need to be a believer to realize, for instance, that a whole food plant-based diet, uh, and it's a po polemical statement right now because that, that's my preferential diet, but you don't need to be a believer to be able to say correct statements about nutrition. You need to be observant, you know, about of yourself, what works for you, other people. You need to be open to new insights in uh, nutritional science, and you will arrive at correct understandings of how the correct understanding of how the human body operates. And I would believe the same thing happens to the human spirit and the human mind. You, you, you do not need to be a believer to understand that negative emotions affect us very negatively. Right? You don't need to be a Christian, you know, Jew, a Muslim to be able to affirm that resiliency in the face of suffering is essential for any philosophy of life. And so that's how I approach Stoicism and that's how I kind of uh, I'm able to appropriate positive things. So again, so that's what I talked about last time. And another thing I mentioned last time was this book by Ross Edgley and I, The Art of Resilience. And I mentioned his remarkable achievement of swimming around Great Britain. And last time I gave some numbers and they were not quite precise. So I can give them right now, right? He, he swam for 157 days. It took him 157 days to swim 1,780 miles. It is an equivalent of swimming the channel, right? 85 times. He was not sick, sick days zero. He was never sick. He ate 649 uh, bananas. He had 2.3 million strokes, swim strokes. He consumed over a million of calories and was uh, stung by over 100 jelly fish, encountered some whales, saw some sharks, one shark at least, over 1,000 seals and so on and so forth. So this is quite an uh, amazing achievement. And Ross Edgley, if you ever look him up on YouTube, I mean, yeah, he has this kind of great personality, an amazing contagious smile. And so you can find out about him and some of his other uh, books that he wrote, things that he, that he did. Um, he is the author of the best-selling, as it says here, the world's fittest book. So in the book, as I stated also last time, he is developing a stoic, I mentioned stoic philosophy, sports philosophy, but he calls it stoic sports science. And so I thought, why don't I just share 
a couple of insights that he is sharing in his book to connect it with my previous episode. I won't be referencing, I won't be reading all his references to the Stoics, but perhaps a couple of sentences will suffice. So for instance, on, per, on page 39, he quotes Marcus Aurelius, and he says, wrestle to be the man philosophy wish, philosophy wished to make you. And I have to say, the moment I am kind of in the morning sometimes, or when I have and I prepare some meals, uh, I've been li listening to um, the meditations by, by Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius, and it is that sentence just the other week when I heard it really stuck with me, right? Wrestle to be the man philosophy wished to make you. A and you can kind of expand it, right? Wrestle to be the kind of person that the Bible wants you to be. Strive to be the kind of person that your values envision. Like, take it seriously. Search for the kingdom of God. Now, don't take the easy way out. Like, try to align yourself. Try to, try to achieve congruency between who you are and your deepest convictions. And I think that is a, a great statement. And again, you don't need to be a stoic, nor need, do you need to be a Christian to be able to say something like that. But for me, these are some good commonalities that he is uh, articulating. He then writes about how for him, uh, sports science, um, stoic sports science and stoic sport philosophy is about kind of merging a strong body and a strong mind and a strategic plan, right? And for me, as someone who is interested in the craft of living, um, I took note of that, right? I think that um, I want to forge not just a strong mind and a strong body, but also a strong spirit. You know, you can have the religious dimension, the mental dimension, the bodily dimension, also the relational dimension. You can add other dimensions. But also understand that you can achieve those things if you have a strategic plan, if you're mindful about how you will pursue these goals and these values. So that was quite, quite interesting that he shared that. And then on page 43, he is referencing again Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. And he says that Epictetus, who uh, would constantly, he would constantly remind the students of his school that philosophy was something they should write down day by day, and that a written diary was a way they should exercise themselves with constant and continual reflection and self-improvement. The same thing is with Seneca. For him, journaling was more a solo endeavor, and his favorite time was to write in the evenings, and when his wife went to bed and all of this, and then this is what Seneca said or what Seneca writes, I examine my entire day and go back over what I've done and said, hiding nothing from myself, passing nothing by. He would then go to sleep, finding that the sleep which follows this self-examination was always better. The same thing we have in Marcus Aurelius. And so here's the questions that we could ask. Let me just step back. So for Agile, it is the exercise of, of journaling which is an exercise of mindfulness, which is an exercise of coming to terms with our actions and events that have taken place during a day, which then also is simply a way for us to acquire greater self-knowledge, better self-understanding of our strengths and weaknesses and what divine providence and divine grace has brought into our lives. So here are some of the questions that we could perhaps journal about. What bad habit did I curb today? How am I, am I better? Were my actions just? How can I improve? And so these are questions that perhaps that he would ask, and you can ask questions that are more pertinent to you or more in alliance with or congenial to your particular life philosophy. So I found this to be quite, quite interesting. Then he has some, some other things that he writes about. Another quote by Marcus Aurelius on page 63. He writes, everything, a horse, a wine, is created for some duty. For what task then were you yourself created? 
a man's true delight is to do the things he was made for. I mean, so to align yourselves, yourself, not just with the values that you have and the purposes that you have in your life, but also align yourself with how you were created. Like if you're a Christian, for you, this will be align yourself with the purposes of God. Um, but so that is an important thing. Who am I meant to be here as an individual within the context of my individual responsibilities, my vocation, the network of interactions I have with other people, being in tune with the gifts and talents I have. So what, is, what are my responsibilities as Ante? And what are your responsibilities in your setting? But then also, what are some of the universal responsibilities I have by virtue of being a son of God or being a daughter of God? So these are important questions that we certainly should ask. Let me share just a few more here. For instance, he quotes Seneca. He says, floods will rob us of one thing, fire of another. And this is really what Paul writes about in Philippians chapter 4, which I'm going to reflect on in one of my future episodes. These are conditions of our existence which we cannot change. What we can do is adopt a noble spirit. Such a spirit benefits a good person so that we may bear up bravely under all that fortune or life, right, sends us and bring our wills into tune with nature's. Insofar as this calls to a simply spirit of resignation, I'm a little bit leery of that. But insofar as it reminds me that as a Christian, I will experience moments of tragedy, things that I cannot change. And finding a way to deal with these difficult moments, not being thrown into despair, not into self-pity, not into a defeatist negative view of life and the world, insofar as it speaks to that necessary need of human resilience, I can only say amen to that. So these are just a couple of quotes from the book, and I really enjoy that quite a bit, seeing how Ross Edgley references Stoicism. And I didn't, what I didn't do here, because I just mentioned a couple of quotes, I, I didn't have time and I simply couldn't do it to show, to show to you how he then incorporated that into his adventure of swimming around Great Britain and how those kind of ideas really help him to persist and complete this amazing feat. So I think this really brings us to a topic that I have recently blogged on and that is the question of resilience. I hope to pick this up next time because if there's anything that we need in this year, it is to grow in our spirits, to be able to be stronger, have greater mental toughness, be able to persist, be able to find possibilities and good things even in the midst of tragedy. And I, again, hope to be able to talk about that. Well, but until then, let me say goodbye to you and in the true kind of spirit of promoting the need for resilience, let me say, don't give up, never give up, uh, be courageous, and keep on growing. Until next time, goodbye.